The Alter Rebbe, the author of Bitanya and the Shulchan Aruch, had a chassid, an older man, a great scholar, who had mastered all areas and all parts of Torah, and then became a chassid of the Alter Rebbe and began to study Hasidic teachings as well as all the others. For eight years, the man studied with the Alter Rebbe. And on his 60th birthday, he went to see the Rebbe privately. And in the course of the conversation, the Rebbe said to him, the, word, the letters of the word Mishnah are the same as the letters of the word Nishama, soul. Because the study of Mishnah is very good for the soul. And for your soul, the Rebbe said to him, it is beneficial that you become a wagon driver rather than a rabbi. Well, this Chassid Reb Yasef was his name, of Beshenkovitz, had never been a rabbi. He was a great scholar, had never been interested in taking the position of a rabbi, but preferred to study privately and spend all his hours, all his days, immersed in the holy books. He was known throughout the area as a great scholar. People would come to him with all sorts of questions. Other rabbis would consult him on questions of halacha and Jewish law. And so this whole statement that the Rebbe said to him, that better for your soul is better to become a wagon driver, a coachman, than to become a rabbi, he didn't understand this at all. And because he, because it made no sense to him, he basically put it out of his mind, continued to study for many years, and close to the time that he was pushing 70, he received a delegation from the large city asking him to become the rabbi of their of their congregation. When they asked him to become the rabbi, the the, uh, the statement that the al Rebbe had said to him came back to him. Better to be a wagon driver than to become a rabbi. During these years, from the time that he was 60, and... Um, had had not been married, the Rebbe said to him, "It is time at that in that same in that same uh, audience, same interview." The Rebbe had said to him, "It is time for you to get married, and I bless you with children." And he had gotten married miraculously during those years, and his wife had given birth to a little boy. So what the Rebbe had said to him had all been fulfilled. And now when these words came back to him, that it's better for your soul to become a wagon driver than a rabbi, he knew that it was time that he fulfilled that instruction. Of course, the thought of becoming a wagon driver was very, very painful and and distasteful. The wagon drivers had a society of their own they were not known as the most refined, as the most respectable people in the community. And for a man of his stature, for a man of his learning, for a man of his sensibilities, to become a wagon driver was was unthinkable. And so the idea tormented him for days and weeks. He knew that he had to do it. And yet he couldn't bring himself to take the first steps towards becoming, of all things, a wagon driver. Finally, he got up the courage and uh, approached the the, uh, stables where the wagon drivers uh, used to hang out. And he asked them if they would teach him to become, uh, how how to be a wagon driver. He knew nothing about horses, about saddles, about wagons. At first, the other wagon drivers 
left thinking that he was joking. It, it was just it was just unthinkable. And somebody made a comment that the Hebrew word for wagon is very similar to the Hebrew word for uh, making making uh, vessels kosher through um, through heat. If a vessel was unkosher, you can make it kosher again by burning out the taste. So the Hebrew word for burning out the taste uh, is very similar to the, to the Hebrew word for wagon. So one of the wagon drivers said, Rabbi Yosef, you probably mean making, di- making dishes kosher. You're confusing it with a wagon. You stick to the Talmud. Leave the wagons to us. But when they realized that he was serious, one of them offered to show him how to, how to get a horse into harness. For a few hours, they practiced and being of, of, uh, an advanced age and not familiar at all with this physical activity and with horses, this poor man came home completely covered with dirt. Uh, he had, he had, uh, he was in pain. He was sore. He had almost lost an eye when the horse, the horse's tail caught him in the face. He was, he was shattered. He was broken. There was no way he could do this. This was impossible. This was unthinkable. And yet, that Ebbe had said. And so he cried himself to sleep. And the next couple of days, he, w- he walked around completely lost, confused, not knowing what he was supposed to do. He cried at the thought of interrupting the study of Torah that he had devoted himself to for the last 50 years and to become a wagon driver. Why? What did he do? What kind of a punishment is this for a person at this age and of this station in life to give it all up and become a wagon driver? It tormented him so badly that he started to lose weight. He couldn't eat. And when he realized that he wasn't keeping the schedule of learning that he was accustomed accustomed to, he knew that he had to do something. And so he followed the advice of the sages, and that is to consult and take advice from your wife. Now his wife had heard about his visit to the wagon drivers, and she was convinced that he was losing his mind. And so she was sitting by the crib with the baby and crying to herself when he walked in, and he realized why she was crying. And he finally told her the whole story, that 10 years earlier he had been by the Alter Rebbe, and the Alter Rebbe had told him that he would get married and that he would have a child and that all of that came true, and now it's time to fulfill the rest of what the Alter Rebbe had said, and that is to become a wagon driver rather than a rabbi. His wife, who had not been taught who had never gone to school, who had never studied Hasidus, said to him, in that case, if your Rebbe told you, then what's the problem? What's the question? Here are my pearls. Sell them. You'll be able to buy a wagon, a horse and wagon, and you'll start a trip. You'll start a, a, a route, and you'll, and you'll take people and, and packages, and you'll do what the Rebbe told you to do. Why are you crying? Why are you upset? On the one hand, Rabbi Yosef was very moved by his wife's sincere, clear-eyed, direct, and, and deep faith in a tzaddik, in the Alter Rebbe. That although she had not studied with the Alter Rebbe, although she was not a chassid on her, on her own, yet when she heard that the Rebbe had told him to become a wagon driver, there wasn't any problem, there wasn't any hesitation in her thinking and in her heart. She was ready to give up her pearls and her and her jewelry to enable her husband to fulfill the instructions that his Rebbe had given him. But on the other hand, this shattered him even more. He couldn't understand what had happened to him. 
He was the scholar. He was the one who understood what a tzaddik is. He's the one who studied the Kabbalah. He's the one who studied the Hasidic teachings. He's the one who had been traveling to the to the Rebbe for eight years, thinking that he was devoted, thinking that he was committed, thinking that he was so special. And here his wife, who had none of those privileges, had a greater faith, a clearer faith, and a stronger faith than he. And so again he cried himself to sleep, feeling that he didn't understand anymore what life was all about and who he was and what he was. But he knew that now he was going to become a wagon driver. The thought also came to him that there was another chassid by the name of Yeshaya who was a wagon driver. That was his, that was his trade. That was his livelihood. And he knew that this man, Yeshaya, had memorized all of the Mishnah, the entire six uh, sections of the Mishnah, by heart. And while he would drive or, or get the horses ready or, or, uh, or grease the wagon, while he was working, he would be reviewing and repeating the words of the Mishnah by, by heart. He also never failed to... Um, to, to pray with the, with the congregation, to daven with the minion. He never failed to study in the evenings. And so he realized that it's possible to maintain some study schedule or some amount of studying even as a wagon driver. And so he went to this particular chassid and asked him to educate him in the art of wagon driving, of a coachman. And this chassid went ahead and taught him and he bought himself a horse and wagon, and set himself a schedule of trips and a a route, and made sure that he would always come in time to the destination, in time for the for the for the uh, for the davening, for the prayers, and evenings were spent studying. And so things went for a number of years. One time, he came to a certain city and checked into the hotel. In this vicinity where he was in the hotel, the duke, the local duke, had gotten together a uh, hunting party, and they were out hunting deer. One of the uh, members of this entourage was a Jewish man who had drifted away from Jewish tradition and culture. He was a very bright young man, and uh, the, the, the Count and his young friends were very impressed with this man, were always complimenting him. And so he tended to spend all of his free time away from his Jewish friends, spending it rather with the Count and his family and his friends and so on. And as they grew up together, he became a member of the inner circle of the uh, court, of the Duke's court, and uh, was very close friends with the Count. And when the Count grew up, um, he this Jewish boy had completely severed all relations with the Jewish community. He had stopped being observant. He had broken his parents' heart and went off and ma- married out into the family of, of this Count. And now he was going along on one of the hunting trips. However, the Count needed him to go off on some mission, So he cut the trip short, and while the others were still out hunting, he came looking for a hotel room and needed a wagon to take him to his uh, on his mission to this destination, wherever it was. The innkeeper, knowing that Yosef was uh, was a wagon driver, uh, hooked them up with each other, and uh, gave. Yosef, the wagon driver, the opportunity to do some business with this uh, member of the of the Duke's court. They spoke about timing, and it turned out that the Duke's friend needed to leave early in the morning, and Reb Yosef's schedule, uh, his 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 practice was that he wouldn't leave before the morning prayers, and you couldn't say the morning prayers until a certain hour of daylight. And so it didn't work out. So the man went back to the innkeeper to find him a different wagon. The 
The innkeeper was very surprised. How do you turn down such a customer? He went back to Rabbi Yosef and badgered him about taking this customer and, and, and doing the trip. And Rabbi Yosef insisted that he has to, that his schedule for all these years has been that he doesn't leave, doesn't begin a journey until he's finished his prayers and you can't pray that early. Finally, he went back to his room. And this badgering and, and the need to defend himself uh, for the right to say his prayers in the morning before going off on a trip really got to him. And it brought back all the painful memories. And he again revisited this whole idea of what had become of him. Here he was, a great scholar, uh, a, a great intellect, a man of learning, a man of books. And... And now what? Now he drives a wagon. Now he's, he's diminished to, to a simple laborer. And when he wants to even say his prayers, like every Jew says in the morning, like any, like any Jew would in the morning, he has to argue about it and get all this grief from the innkeeper about how, uh, it doesn't make sense to refuse such a customer just because you want to do your prayers. And so he started preparing for bed and the, the bedtime Shema, the prayers before going to sleep. And he said his prayers with greater devotion than usual. And in the middle of the prayers, he began to cry over, over the, the tragedy that had, that had befallen him, that he had, that he had come to such a condition in life at his age where he has to argue with people about saying his prayers. He didn't know it, but in the room adjoining his at the inn, the Count's friend was trying to sleep. The walls were very thin. The Count's friend was lying in bed, and he hears Rabbi Yosef saying his bedtime Shema. The words sounded vaguely familiar. The tune was familiar. And when Rabbi Yosef began to cry, it touched this, the Count's friend so deeply that he couldn't sleep at all. It brought back memories of his parents, of his father who used to say the bedtime Shema with the same tune. Brought back all the thoughts of how he had drifted away from his, from his family, from his tradition, from mitzvahs, how he had slowly given up keeping kosher, how the first time he had violated Shabbos in order to go with his friends, and how he was miserable. He had no life. He was respected, admired, and accepted by the Count and his family, but he didn't really belong. He wasn't part of it. Even now, being sent off on this mission, the Count would never have sent any of his other relatives. And so he felt a deep regret over the change of life that he had, that he had, in, that he had brought. And he yearned to go back to the old way, to his father's way. But how could he? It was too late. And so he began to cry. In the morning, Yosef got up and was preparing for his, uh, for his, for his morning prayers. And there's a knock on the door. He opens the door and the Count's friend was standing there, his eyes swollen and red from crying. And he mumbled something about borrowing the tefillin. He wanted to borrow the Yosef's tefillin so that he could pray the way he used to when he was a bar mitzvah boy. Of course, Abrasive gave him the tefillin, thinking that he would get it back in 20 minutes. But 20 minutes came and went, an hour came and went, two hours, the man isn't returning the tefillin. So he goes to the door, to the man's door, to find out what's going on, and he hears the man crying, sobbing, uh, with bitter tears on the other side, and he left him alone. In the afternoon, the man finally opened his door and returned the tefillin. 
later that evening, obviously this guy had, was not going on any trip anywhere, but later that evening, he asked the innkeeper to get him a doctor. He wasn't feeling well. When Rabbi Yosef heard this, he thought something is going on here, something very deep, very profound, very, and I better stay and see what's going on. So although he was scheduled to leave, he uh, decided to stay the night. The doctor came and examined the patient and found that he was burning up with fever, something very, um, something very painful was creating a deep disturbance in this man, and uh, there was nothing the doctor could do. In the morning, when the fever hadn't broken, the doctor basically announced that the man is going to die and there's nothing we can do. He's wasting away in front of our eyes. He's burning up, and uh, not, the medicine didn't help any, and if the, if the fever doesn't break soon, he's he's a goner. On top of that, a messenger arrived from back home telling this man that his wife, who was a cousin of the Duke, and his child had been boating when the boat tipped over and both drowned. Now the doctors were debating whether he should be told this news. On the one hand, who are they to keep the news from him? But on the other hand, they were certain that another grief, a little more pain, and the man is going to, is going to pass away. Abiasif felt responsible for what was going on and asked permission to visit with the patient. The doctors had basically given up hope and thought there could be no harm and they let him visit. He went into the room. And he began to encourage the man to go back to the, to a life of, of, of Judaism, to a life of mitzvahs, to a life of Torah. And that he would help him, he would guide him, he would take him by the hand and show him how to get back into Jewish life. Miraculously, the man opened his eyes. And by the time the doctors came back to check on him, he was sitting up in bed. The man did, in fact, ask permission to move away from the city because of the painful memories that it, that it carried. The Duke understood that very well and gave him permission to, to move away. And there in that new place, the man followed Rabbi Yosef's study curriculum or, or syllabus and re-educated himself into Jewish life into mitzvahs and Torah, and began to conduct himself as a full-fledged Jew. During these years, the Alter Rebbe had passed away, and his son had succeeded him and was known as the Mittel Rebbe. Rabbi Yosef now would travel for holidays to the Mittel Rebbe. And when he came that year for Rosh Hashanah to the Mittel Rebbe, the, uh, the Rebbe's secretary uh, sought him out and said, the Rebbe wants to see you. Went into the Rebbe's room, and the Rebbe said to him, your mission has been accomplished. That man who you helped come back to, to, to his roots, to come back to his Judaism, uh, was the reason for your becoming a wagon driver. Now that you've accomplished it, there's no reason for you to remain there, to remain as a wagon driver. Now it is appropriate that you become a rabbi. And soon after that, he was approached by another congregation asking that he become their rabbi, and this time he accepted. The Baal Shem Tov said that a soul comes down into this world for 70 or 80 years of course, to live a good life, to do good things. But it is possible that the entire life, the entire 70 or 80 years, are necessary because of one favor 
that we can do, that this soul can do to another, either physically or spiritually, materially or spiritually. That there are times when a soul comes down into this world specifically because of a favor that this soul is going to do for another soul, either materially or spiritually. Of course, as long as life is given, many good things can be accomplished in a life. But the reason for this life, the reason for this soul coming down into this world is primarily for that one favor that we can do for another person. And in this case, in Abyasif's case, that one favor and that one person was actually identified. For most of us, we don't know. We don't know who that person is. We don't know what the favor is. So we go about life trying to do as many favors to as many people as possible because that one favor could justify and could explain and could fulfill the purpose for which we were born in the first place. The other point of the story is Rabbi Yosef's reaction to his wife's simple, strong, true, and unwavering faith. That simplicity, that clarity, that is sometimes clouded by scholarship, by a lot of learning, is what the aim of Hasidus is to bring together <clears throat> that kind of simplicity with scholarship. Rabbi Yosef was one of the early Hasidim, the first generation when this synthesis was attempted or tested. To be on the one hand <clears throat> a learned, knowledgeable, scholarly person and at the same time not lose any of that simplicity, any of that purity, any of that childlike innocence that allows for such unadorned, artless, sincere, true faith. 